We thank you. You're a good, good daddy. We praise you, Father God. We're excited, Father, to see what you're going to do this year. God, I'm confident in you. You're going to show up and blow up. God, you're going to challenge us. God, you're going to provoke us, Father God. You're going to take us to new heights that we've never been. God, I thank you that you take care. You meet every need we have. You're an ever-present help in, in times of need. I thank you. You're, you're not a God that's far away. Isaiah says you're not a God that your ear is too dull to hear or your arm is too soft to save. But you're a, so, a strong God. Yeah. Yes, God, we thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Awesome. Amen. Welcome to 2016. Come on, somebody. <laughs> yeah. We're, who's excited about this year? Woo, that got loud. Yeah, man, come on. Hey, two quick things before we jump into to the message aspect. I'm just so thankful. God, I do want to thank you again for your presence, just being here already. Uh, first of all, guys, uh, we talked about camp a little bit. If you're willing, we're going to Florida. How awesome is that to camp? We're right in Panama City. We're right across from the, uh, um, from the beach. It's going to be a once-in-a-lifetime event for many of our kids. And anyhow, it's $300. If, if, if God puts it on your heart, I'm not begging, I'm not asking, but if God puts it on your heart to sponsor a child, would you get with me or get with Gene or Kevin or Bird, get with one of the youth leaders and just say, hey, I want to help, help get a kid to camp. Don't feel pressure on that. I just simply wanted uh, to, to make the Bible says you have not because you asked not. Amen. So I wanted to make the need known. Second of all, guys, again, tonight, 630 at the Assembly of God, we invited them over a few weeks ago or a few months ago, and they came, and Pastor John preached, and we had a great service. Um, they're doing the same thing. They've invited us over and, and asked me to preach. And um, so we're going to have an awesome night tonight, so please come join us at the Assembly of God at 630. It's going to be a lot of fun. Come on, somebody. Amen. I've had the flu all week, so I'm kind of coffee, so bear with me. We're going to talk for the next few weeks um, about shift. Somebody say shift. shift. Yeah, now say it like you mean it. Shift. There you go. I'm excited to see what God's going to do in 2016, and I'm confident that there is going to be quite a shift that takes place. As I was thinking about that, I, I was reminded, even this morning, of when I was teaching my wife, girlfriend at the time, Megan, how to drive a, a manual or a stick shift. Anybody ever taught a, uh, someone how to drive a, uh, it's funny. Uh, and so anyhow, she's probably, I don't know, 17 years old. And we get, out the, we get out my parents' driveway and we get to the corner of J Highway. And I said, okay, put it in first gear and let out of the clutch. And so she's in there and we, she pulls one of these. And we finally get it going and she's, all, she's proud of herself because she got off the stop sign. I'm going to go over here. She's looking at me funny. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just kidding, baby. She gets, uh, she gets going, right? And we're running down, the, running down the road, coming toward town. And I'm, I'm listening to the motor start to whine. So we're running in first gear, and we're running 15 miles an hour, 20 miles an hour, 25 miles an hour. About, about, about 5,000 RPMs. That motor is just... Wah! And she just looks over at me. She's like, how's it going? I'm like, shift! <laughs> You're going to blow the motor. You're going to blow the transmission. So she shifts. She's like, oh, I forgot. How often do we forget to shift? Come on, somebody. Amen. So often, but now it's a funny story, but so often in our lives, we forget to shift. We get in one mode or one gear for so long, and what happens, we start running at too high a, a resolutions. We get running at too high. Too, uh, the RPMs are too high, and all of a sudden, we're going, why can't I seem to get why can't I seem to get where I'm going? Why is my motor acting funny? Why is the transmission acting weird? The reality is, it's because sometimes somebody forgets to shift. So often, God's trying to take us to a new level, and we just can't seem to get there in Him. And it's simply because we forgot to shift. Come on, somebody. Amen? We're going to talk about shift. But before we talk about shift, let's talk about what happened in 2015. I'm a goal. I, I like to write goals, and I like to write down my vision and what, God, what I feel like God is saying. And I like to go back and look at it and watch all the things that he's crossed off my list. I'm not going to do it today, but I, we could spend a whole service just simply talking about what God has done in this church. Amen? We're going to share a few. Of course, um, we've seen, man, probably a couple hundred people saved in the last few years. Come on, somebody. Amen? God is doing a good work. Amen. We've seen people totally healed. I love, you guys are kind of crazy. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that about yourself. Y'all are kind of crazy, and I am too. But you guys are crazy givers. I love when evangelists that go big places, they come to our church, and we give a love offering, and we give them, 
what, what they're due because the Bible says the labor is worthy of his hire. We give them and they look at the check and they're like, oh my gosh, do I need to give some back? <laughs> I love that. I love to hear how they love to come to our church. One, because God shows up and we have an amazing service. And two, because we, we love on, on them. Amen? Consumed by fire. They're on the K-Love now and, and, or Air One and the radio. And they love, they tell me every time they come, this is one of our favorite spots. And I'm usually standing somewhere in there and I look around at this building. And I think they travel all over the world. They do big shows. They open for huge names. And they love coming to the hill. That's awesome, man. You guys are crazy. Yeah, I love it, man. I'm <laughs> last year, uh, January 18th last year, some of y'all remember this. There was a church that desperately needed a van. What did we do, church? We bought, the, we bought them a van. Now, someone says, you can't do that for another church. No, we have to because it ain't about us. It's about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God going forward. We bought them another van. Guys, that's insane. But I'm so happy to report that wasn't all we did, man. All year long, you guys gave. It was incredible. We bought this kid's facility this year because we had nowhere to have kids. So we actually, we've been leasing it. We paid cash for it this year. Also, we paid off the rest of the debt on this building. This building is debt-free. Yeah. Now, those of y'all that weren't clapping, obviously, you must already be debt free, or you don't even understand what that means. <laughs> Come on, somebody. That's exciting what God is doing. It's really incredible. I, I wrote down on my list, and I said, God, we want to reach the world for you. The Lord told me one time in prayer in my office, He said, This church is going to have global influence. And again, I look around. I'm like, Lord, do you know who you're talking to? <laughs> You know, I'm happy to announce we're, we've got media going. We have people that listen in from Beijing, China, other parts of China, Germany, Brazil, Europe, Canada, all over the world. People are tuning in. I don't know how it happens. It don't matter. God's good. You, 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 you got to get that. You crazy people are reaching the world for Christ. Come on, somebody. It's been an awesome 2015, but I cannot wait for 2016 because, baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be so much fun, man. We, I feel like we've been on a fringe for quite a while. We've been just right on the cusp. I don't golf very well. Often I find myself about stroke number five or six on the fringe of the green, not on the green. Amen. And it's time for many of us. We've been on the fringe of this thing for long enough. Deuteronomy 1 says this. You've been by this mountain long enough. He said, break camp, advance, and go forward. See, a lot of us have been on the fringe of something awesome for quite some time. And I feel the Holy Spirit telling me months ago, he said, you got to begin to shift. you got to begin to shift. We're going to shift into the overflow this year. Guys, I am so excited of what God's going to do. I feel like this year, for many of us, we're no longer going to be the victim, but we're going to be the victor. Amen? We're no longer going to be a slave to our struggles and a slave to addiction. Come on, somebody. But we're going to be a warrior in the faith. i got to tell you, David's mighty men. They came to him, and they could sling a stone. Uh, Camber, how are you? Camber's got, um, stand up real quick, Camber. I'm going to embarrass you real fast. Camber, guys, is amazing. She's awesome. She releases her new single January 12th. January 12th. Yeah. So get online and check that out. She's very talented. God has certainly blessed her and anointed her with quite a gift. Moving back in. David's mighty men, they could sling a stone or shoot a bow and arrow and split a hair off of the top of Kevin's head. Kevin, stand up. He ain't got much. They could split a hair off the top of his head from a distance. But when they got to David, they were broke as a joke on coke. Come on, somebody. They didn't have nothing to offer. They were hurting. They were in debt. They were depressed. But when God got in the mix, come on, he changes our identity not to who we are, but to who he's created us to be. You understand what I'm saying? He says this year, no longer are you going to be a slave, but you're going to be a warrior. The Bible says you're the head and not the tail. You're blessed in the cities and in the fields. You're blessed. The Bible says coming and going. The Lord been dealing my heart. He said no more less than living. No more. Barely eking by thinking by the grace of God. Now listen, I'm thankful for the grace of God. But the grace of God, he didn't give his grace so I could eat by. He gave his grace so that I could be an overcomer by the, word of the, by the word of my testimony and the blood of the Lamb. He gave his grace so I could be more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. Come on. He gave, he gave, the, he gave me his grace so that when the enemy comes as a roaring lion, I can be a lion tamer. You feel me? 
See, 2016, guys, is going to be an amazing year. I feel it's going to be the year where we shift into our identities. I feel like it's going to be a year that we shift into what God has called us to be and who God has called us to be. See, it's important for you to know your identity because you can't do what God has called you to do if you don't know who God has called you to be. You can't, you can't walk into kingdom with authority if you've still got a defeated mindset. But the Bible says you're a winner, man. He, he, he died on the cross. Not so, I hear people say this all the time. Well, it doesn't matter if you win or lose. It's how you play the game. You're a loser. <laughs> That's offensive, isn't it? Well, quit being a loser. <laughs> Now that's harsh, I know. But the reality is, Jesus didn't, I can imagine, I just imagine Jesus on the cross, hanging up there and going, sorry God, I did my best, I quit. It does matter. God made you to be victors. Now I've lost plenty, but I ain't no loser. I've been made to be a winner. Come on somebody. You were made for more. You were made to be winners. We got to understand our identity in him. For two and a half years, God has put in my heart. He said, you're going to be a church that raises people up and sends them out into ministry. Guys, we're doing it. This year, we sent up Mud and Mire, and they, they, they traveled all over. They're even leading worship right now at a church on Sunday mornings to help a church that doesn't have it. Come on, somebody. Amen. That's the call of the gospel. It ain't just trying to build, build one, one little place where God shows up. It's trying to send people out so that the world can experience God. I'm, I'm happy to announce early on, uh, Larry Clarkson, some of y'all know him, he came to our church and he was hurt and, and some things had happened and, and, and he, he could do a lot of what I needed early on in ministry. He had a heart to do some things. And as I was like, we started planning events, man. I thought, man, this guy has got what it takes. The Holy Spirit said, no, not for you. He doesn't. Come on, somebody. He said, I've called him to pastor. You love him, you let him heal, and you kick him out. So we did. He pastors the church now. I got to tell you my, my last little exciting thing. It's going to be exciting all day. But I'm so excited to announce that we are starting a church in India. Man, you, you said that like you don't care. I said we're starting a church in India, guys. That's insane. Guys, with Pastor Norman, you guys have met him. He has the same heart. That's why we've connected the same heart to raise people up and send them out. So he had a pastor that didn't have any way to make it, all right? So we are helping him rent the building and pay his salary. And it's because the exchange rate, it's so low. I'm so thankful for, like, we send him like $500 a month and we're able to help start a church in India. I got to tell you the exciting part. They already, we've been given for two months now. And I don't know at what point that their starter started, but they have 70 people going to that church. Come on, somebody. See, it ain't about you. It ain't about me. It's about the kingdom of God, and it's time we shift into something awesome. Amen. Come on, somebody. Matthew 5, 14 says that we are a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Come on, somebody. That's our call is to lift Jesus up. Psalm 121, uh, for those of you guys that have your the hill cup, you'll see the bottom of that verse. It says this, look unto the hills where my, the, um, the NASB says mountains, the hills is another word. Look unto the hills where my help shall come from, where my salvation shall come from. Don't you understand? We are a city on a hill. Come on, somebody. We're to be the light for the lost. But in order for this to happen, you've got to shift. i got to shift, and we as a church got to shift. we got to shift in prayer. we got to shift in power. we got to shift in purpose. And we've got to shift in our pursuit of the king. Amen? We're going to talk today for the next few moments of time about shifting in prayer. Second Chronicles 7, verses 1 through 3. Here we go. Now, when Solomon had finished praying, comma, that excited me. That just got me. There was a need. There was a need in the kingdom of God. There was a need for, for a place, a house for them to worship. And so Solomon dedicates it to... Now when Solomon had finished praying, they didn't have to put that. They could have said, and fire came down from heaven. But when Solomon had... You've got to understand, when we begin to shift in our prayer life, everything begins to change. You've got to understand, there is no substitute for an active prayer life. Come on, somebody. A shift will take place in your life as a result of fellowshipping the Father. There'll be a shift in your personal world as a result of fellowshipping a God that is crazy about you. We can't get to the next level. You can't get to the next gear in what you're doing without intimacy with the Holy Spirit or simply an active prayer life. Now listen, I say this and people think, okay, that means that I have to wake up in the morning and, and, and lay, on my, lay on my face and not do anything for 24 hours. That's not what an active prayer life is. The Bible says this, it says to pray without ceasing. Does that mean, Larry, that, that, that means that uh, you eat? You, you don't ever eat? 
You eat. <laughs> he eats. Well, so he's, not, he, he's taking a breath. It's not saying that you don't do anything all day long except for pray. That's not what he's saying. He, what he's saying there, he says, I want to have an active, open line of communication with you so that I can direct you in your life, so that I can give you hope and encouragement, and so that I can, that I can speak to you. He says, I, I, I want to do something awesome, but in order for me to do that into your life, we have to have this open, active line of communication. Guys, your place or your time of p- prayer, your prayer life will empower you to do what God has called you to do. I've talked to a lot of people that, oh, I feel like God's called me to do this and that and the other. And that's incredible. But if you don't have an active, open line relationship with him, I got got some unfortunate news. It ain't going to happen. Because you won't be in position to do what he's called you to do. When Solomon had finished praying, nothing replaces an active relationship with God. And let's move on in the verse. Fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices um, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. So here's what happened, okay? They had the sacrifice. They had killed it. They had cut it. It was ready. They had put the wood under it. But they were waiting for God's fire to fall. I got some awesome news. F- God's fire will always fall on a sacrifice. Now that's hard. It's hard sometimes to sacrifice. See, sacrifice isn't just giving something easy. Because David said this, he was, he was going to make a sacrifice, and the owner of the land that he was going to sacrifice on said, well, I'll give it to you. But David said, I won't offer anything to God that's cheap. Ooh. We're trying to offer some cheap stuff to the Father. Matter of fact, it was because of a cheap sacrifice that Cain was rejected. God's fire will always fall on sacrifice. What does Romans 12, 1 and 2 say? I beseech you, he, Paul says, he says, I'm begging you. In the view of what God's done in your life, to offer your body as a living sacrifice. I love that because I all the time talk to people, especially in this day and age, with ISIS and all the, all the fear the enemy's trying to, to, I ain't afraid of nothing. Come on, somebody. I got a good daddy. I, I talk to people, they say, well, bless God, I would die if they asked me. And I think that's good. We should. Amen? Am I a Christian? Of course I am. But so many of us, we're we brave enough to die for it. But ain't very many of us brave enough to live for it. Ooh, I'm going to hide. <laughs> so many of us are, oh, I would die, man, don't, don't tempt me. I, but we ain't brave enough to live for the truth of God. To live for the purpose of God, the call of God. And, and what I mean by that is it, don't, it ain't first in our life. It's on the list. But I got, I got some bad news. He don't want to be on the list. He wants to be number one. Fire will always fall in sacrifice. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you in the brother. Um, in the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. You know what he's saying? He said, I want you to have a lifestyle of sacrifice. Now here's the good news. When we have a lifestyle of sacrifice, guess what we get in return? A lifestyle of fire. That's good stuff. See, we have a lifestyle that says, okay, God, this is what I want to do, but what do you say about it? What, what, what is your opinion? This is what I want, but what do you say? When we have a lifestyle that puts him first, when we have a lifestyle of sacrifice, Mike, we get a lifestyle of his fire. Now that right there makes some people nervous because they're like, I don't want to be like you. You're crazy. Yeah, I am. I don't want you to be like me either. Sometimes I don't want to be like me. <laughs> Understand my heart, guys. When we have a lifestyle of sacrifice, we get a lifestyle of fire. So he, he finishes praying, fire falls on the sacrifice, and then what happened? First uh, Chronicles 7, or 2 Chronicles 7, go back to verse 1. Fire came down and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the house. When the fire come down, what happened? The glory of the Lord. It was in the form of what? Smoke. So when the fire consumed the burnt offering, smoke was the result. That smoke was God's glory. I got some awesome news. And we have a lifestyle of sacrifice. We have a lifestyle of fire. And the result of that is being totally consumed by the glory of God. Now that even in and of itself, because we don't truly understand his glory, we think, well, okay, that's cool, Bo, good word, but what does that even mean? I can tell you what that means. That's a, ooh, I'm about to shout. A lifestyle of sacrifice equates to a lifestyle of the fire of God, which is a lifestyle in the glory. When you live in the glory, you live in total abundance. There's nothing lacking in the glory of God. I love it because the Bible says this, in his pleasure is what? At his right hand, in his pleasure is what? 
fullness of joy, and at his right hand is pleasure forever. He says, listen, in my glory, in my presence, when you have a lifestyle that pursues me, when I become first, when you shift in your prayer life and you have this open communication with me, something incredible happens. You get fullness of joy. Fullness means lacking nothing. Now, the problem is I preach that mission so many times, people go, well, Pastor Bo, I ain't got that fullness. I'm tired of you talking about it. That ain't my problem. It sure ain't God's problem. And I would bet, I would say 99 times out of 100, it's on our end. I would say 99 times out of 100, when we're lacking the fullness of God, it's because he's not first. I would say most of the time we hear these promises, we listen to preachers on TV, and, and, I, and I, I do too, that's awesome. But we hear what they have to say, and it's so good. But we look at our life, and we say, why am I not living that way? And most of the time, it's because, it's because uh, you don't have him first. Often, we look at people that are successful. And we say, Kirk, and I know, I'm sure it's happened to you. They say, well, I want to be where you are. And your response most of the time is, are you willing to do what I had to do to get here? See, we want the fullness. But we, don't, we want the promise of God. Minus the process of God. First Peter 1 says that his kingdom, the fullness of God, is abundantly supplied to you. Guys, if he's not number one, he's not even that interested in being on the list. But when we put him first, everything shifts in the line. There's abundance in his glory. Maybe I can explain it like this. We get the abundance of God when we abandon ourselves. We get all he has to offer when we give all we have to offer. The story of the the, the lad that that gave the the two fish and five loaves to feed the 5,000, I love it because the little boy said, I don't got a lot. My two fish, two fish, we're not talking like salmon, okay? We're talking maybe like minnows. They were enough to feed a small boy. And he said, he can, Jesus can have it. But he goes home, the Bible says, with 12 basketfuls left over. See, when we give our little, I call it the, the, um, the, the, the transfer. When we give our little, he gives his much. The Lord told me one time, I was praying about some things that I desired. And the Lord said, Bo, if you give up what you think you want, I'll give you what I know you need. Come on, you, you got to understand what I'm saying. With, with, with the glory of God comes total access to his abundance. It, it, what that means is he's in you in a way that you get to shift the atmosphere. So, uh, Greg, I, for whatever reason, I was thinking about you. Like maybe someone walks into your shop and, and they're ticked because their car broke down, as most people probably are when their car breaks down. Uh, they come to your shop and, and maybe, maybe they, they're frustrated, but you get to shift the atmosphere. You get to just simply speak life over them. I thought about some of our teachers and people that, that, that work in places where they can't talk about God. I, I got some good news. I go to those places. Amen. I was at a school in... in um, Oklahoma just a few weeks ago, a few months ago in September. I can't talk about Jesus, but I can talk about good things, and I can talk about setting yourself up for success. I can talk about the principle of God's word without mentioning his name. So I'm sharing this stuff, and this kid Facebooks me just a few days later, and he said, Pastor, he didn't say Pastor, he said, Bo, I want you to know, thank you for encouraging me not to quit at life. He was suicidal. He said, I want to thank you for encouraging me not to give up. I just found out two weeks ago I have a brain tumor, and I don't know what's going to happen to me. And now he's Facebook, so now I can talk about the fullness. So we talked about the fullness of God. I get a Facebook message, how long, baby, another week later? He said, well, I went back to the doctor, and they don't know what happened. (laughs) I went back to the doctor, and they don't know what happened, but the brain tumor's gone. Come on, somebody. The fullness. Come on, somebody. Mitch, people might walk in your shop and they might be ticked and they might be aggravated and agitated. They might walk into your world. They might be your waitress. They might be your waiter. They may be your husband and your wife. What you get to do because he's in you, because you've got a lifestyle of sacrifice, fire, and the glory of God, you get to then begin to shift the atmosphere. You, begin, you then begin to, get to speak life over the situation. I walked in a restaurant one time months ago and it was just very oppressed. I mean, it was very, like, you walk in, you immediately felt just this depression, right? It was just the enemy and I remember sitting there thinking and and you guys often will have that happen but you don't understand it I it happened for a long time before I understood what was going it was Holy Spirit saying you got to change some things not in my life but in the atmosphere 
And so I, I did, you can ask my wife, I just immediately, in my own self, I began to pray in the Spirit and ask God's glory to fill that house. And I literally walked out, and it was a whole different atmosphere when I walked back to my table. Now, I'm not saying that for any reason. Then you've got to know when you have a lifestyle of sacrifice, you have a lifestyle of abundance, and He's in you is greater than He that's in the world. You get to leave it on in Matthew, I think it's chapter 10. Jesus says this, he says, let your peace rest on other people that receive you. Peace is the atmosphere of heaven. He said, Let's, let what's in you, John, rest on everybody else. Because see, the kingdom wasn't meant for me. The kingdom was meant for all. The kingdom wasn't meant for you. The kingdom was meant for us all. It's time we shift. Come on, somebody. Verse 2. Verse 2 says this. And the priest could not enter into the house of the Lord because the Lord's glory filled the house. I love this, guys. Because when you experience God in this fashion, when your prayer life shifts, everything changes. You cannot go on with the routine. Unfortunately, in our culture, church has become a spectator sport. But God's called you for more. He's called you to shift into who he has created you to be. I love this because they said, well, because God had so showed up in their world, they couldn't go on living the same any longer. They couldn't go through the motions of, of, of the ritual of, of working on their, their equipment or, or, or farming or boating or motorcycle, whatever it was. They couldn't go on with the routine. Something had to change when God's presence shows up. Something absolutely has to change. Psalm 34 verse 8, it says this, taste and see that the Lord is good. When you've tasted the freedom of God, you can't go back. The story of Paul and Silas in prison, I've told it before. They're in prison with all the other prisoners. They start to praise God. The, the, the chains fall off. The, the doors open. And everybody is totally free at this moment, Bo. The jailer comes in and sees all the chains on the ground. He sees all the doors open. And he goes, I'm dead. He grabs his sword and he begins to kill himself. And Paul and Silas yell, wait a minute, don't hurt yourself. We all hear. I like to pose this question, why? We're talking in there is murders and thieves. The worst of the worst are in this jail. They, they didn't go to jail back then for writing bad checks. Paul and Silas are there because they were preaching Jesus and people were getting healed and set free. Why? Why would the prisoners have not ran away? Because the first time in their life they tasted freedom. Not freedom in the natural, but a freedom that set them free from depression on the inside. A freedom that set them free from hurt and anguish and things that had happened to them for maybe 30, 40 years ahead of time. For the first time in their life, they experienced real freedom. And it tastes good. And I'd sooner stay in jail, they said, than walk away from what I feel. Come on, somebody. I had a kitty cat. <laughs> I had a kitty cat. I'm a dog person, but I'm turning into a cat person. And I don't like it. Don't make fun of me. Had this Tinkerbell was her name. I didn't name her. I may help. <laughs> You'd be walking by, and Tink would jump on your shoulders. Literally, you would almost pee your pants. Not being girl. I'm just, you'd be walking by. Like, oh my gosh, there's a cat on my shoulder. It was really fun when people would come by for the first time. It was hysterical. Because they'd just be walking by, and they would think a bear was attacking them. I <laughs> mean. You about lose your salvation when you shout some of the things people would say. <laughs> that cat would bam, jump on their shoulders, but not me. And it was just like, here I am, going to hang out. So you people would walk in by. But then this is what would happen. They'd be like. And they walk with that little kitty on their shoulders. It was so cute. <laughs> it was funny when that cat would jump on your shoulders. It would change everything about you. You, you know, some of the, some people with, sw they call it swag. <laughs> All swag left. All you cared about was this little gray cat on your shoulders. Every step you would take was thinking, I don't want this cat to jump off. You'd go to sit down. <laughs> every, every step... You wouldn't even breathe very hard because you're afraid the cat was going to jump off. Guys, that's how it is with the Holy Spirit. Although we don't have to be afraid. But what if every step we took was with Him in mind? That's freedom. But when I, when I live in this, when I live, every step I take is thinking, God, how does this affect your heart? I walk in a freedom that I don't even understand. But I walk in an abundance that I'm thankful. 
I was talking to Casey this week. I often talk about how, I just talk about talking to God, man, and, and how we thank him for little things like good parking places. Y'all think I'm crazy. Casey texted me this week. He goes, okay, it's nuts. I said, bro, what's nuts? He goes, parking spaces. I've been getting good, good ones all over town because I'm asking God. I went, that's awesome. He goes, it's not over. I've been asking for good deals like you talk about. I got good deals all over town. Y'all keep paying more. Y'all keep thinking I'm lying. But see, when you have the fullness of God, you get his favor and fulfillment. Come on. What if we lived like that? Constantly aware that he's here. That's what they did. They, they, they went through the routine of work. They couldn't, the priest could not clean. All of a sudden, Donnie, they were constantly aware that the Holy Spirit was there also. They were constantly aware that he wanted to affect their life in a positive way. See, when we begin to walk in this, everything begins to change. I, I, I'm being honest. When you begin to walk in this, everything changes. I went to a jail one time and just simply to talk to him about Jesus. And I remember I, I had to go. The, the jailer came in. Sorry, it's time to go. And the prisoner was like, hey, can you stay a little longer? I was like, man, I can't. They went, can you spend the night? <laughs> I, I was like, oh, my wife not, may not like that. I thought about it. I, really, you know, I, thought, I better go home. Now, my point in telling you that is what? It had nothing to do with Bo. Because I'm a big goober. But they felt something in me that's in you. That's the freedom of God. And you carry him to share him with the world. He's in you. You were made for more. Verse 3 says this. And, the, and all the sons of Israel, seeing fire come down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, bowed down on the pavement with their faces to the ground. And they worshiped and gave praise to the Lord, saying, truly he is good. He's a good, good daddy. Truly, his loving kindness is everlasting. All the sons of Israel, all the people in the nation were affected because somebody shifted. That's what you've got to understand. When you shift, your wife is affected. When you shift, your husband is affected. When you shift, your kids are affected. When you shift, your boss is affected. When you shift, your employees are affected. When you shift, your cattle are affected. Someone says, I don't believe it. I don't care. Don't believe it. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. I shifted. When you shift, everything changes. Everything changes. It says that the whole nation begin to praise and worship God. All the people of the city. Guys, when you shift, people see it, and people follow. I thought about Smith Wigglesworth, man. Smith Wigglesworth, he, he, would, he would pray for the dead, and they would come back to life. He went into a funeral one time. He didn't know the guy. He walks into a church that's having a funeral. He walks up front, middle of the funeral, grabs the guy out of the casket. It's a true story. And if I remember it right, he throws him against the wall. And he says, in the name of Jesus, you come back to life. And the guy, <laughs> fell to the ground. Picks him back up. In the name of Jesus, you come back to life. And he slams him against the wall, and the guy... Falls back to the ground. At this point, I would have ran. <laughs> I just said, my name's Caleb Chisholm. I got to go. <laughs> Love you, dude. <laughs> not Smith. He picked the guy up a third time. I kid you not. Threw him against the wall. Poof. He said, in the name of Jesus, you come back to life. He threw him against the wall, and he hits the wall, and the guy opens his eyes. And I'm sure at that point, everybody in the funeral home ran. <laughs> Smith would see the absolute miraculous of God. He would have revivals. He was a plumber in Europe, England, I think. He would have these incredible revivals of God. And they asked him one day, they said, Smith, how do you hold these amazing revivals? And can I tell you what he said? Here's what he said. I get on fire for God, and people circle around me to watch me burn. When you get on fire for God, people are going to watch you burn. They want to see what's going on. They want to see why you're different. How come you're happy? How come you have fullness of joy regardless of your situation? Shift. Guys, people are drawn to the fire of God. Heidi, come on up. People are drawn to the fire of God. Someone says, Pastor Bo, how can you declare 2016 is going to be a year of abundance with, when, when really our, our economy is unstable? 
How can you say that 2016 is going to be a year of abundance when, when ISIS is, is, is causing fear to everybody? How can you say that, that 2016 is going to be a year of abundance and favor when really our political, uh, it's a mess? How can you say that when resources are drying up? How can I? I've shifted. I've shifted my eyes off of the storm and onto my God that calms the storm. I've shifted my eyes off of my fear, and I've shifted them to the faith in the one that has set me free. I've shifted my eyes from all the stress and anxiety. I'm not going to say it doesn't try to get my attention. But when it gets my attention, Lacey, I turn. I mean, I know it does, and it scares me, and fear begins to grip me. And I, in that moment, have to begin to shift in prayer and ask God to bring me back to a place where my hope is in Him. I shift. Chronicles 7 14 it says this if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways and I will hear from heaven forgive their sin and I will heal their land now you got to get what I'm saying at this point somebody someone says how can you declare abundance I didn't say that the world would be in abundance I said you would be if who I struggle with this verse. I see the signs in yards, and I, and I get scared by it because I think, how can I expect? 93% of politicians claim to have faith in Jesus Christ, but how many of them live that faith? I, I, I read that, I think, God, that we're hopeless. Fear. God, how can we expect that to, to, how can we expect that to turn? How can I expect them to pray and humble themselves? And here's what the Holy Spirit told me. He said, Bo, I didn't tell you. I didn't tell them to told you to if my people who are called by my name and we're all called but if you're submitting to him I've called you to pray I'll heal from heaven I'll forgive you and heal you and I will heal put it back up there I will heal their land but when you shift in prayer, you live in the abundance of my glory. Church, when we shift, depression has to go. I'm not going to say it. It won't be a fight still. But when, when you shift, you give him access to begin to take over and heal your land. When you shift, you give him access to, to take over and to forgive and to, to bring hope and life and joy and strength and fullness. When you shift... When you shift, people that hurt you years ago, all of a sudden you begin just to forgive and let go of. Because it ain't about you. When you shift and begin to walk like that stinking cat is on your shoulder. When you shift and begin to recognize that he's there. And he's there for your good. I got some news for you. God didn't call you because, he, because you're good. He called you because he's good. He didn't call you because you were good enough or, or you had what it takes. He called you because he's good and he has what it takes. And he in you is an overcomer. He called you because he wants to bring fullness of joy. But pastor, I don't walk in that fullness. I understand. It's time to put him first. It's time to shift. Would you bow your heads? God, we love you today. We thank you today for your goodness. But I thank you for the great things that you've done through this house. But I declare in the name of Jesus, we ain't seen nothing yet. But I declare, this is the year of abundance because we shift. One of those ways we shift is in prayer. Guys, first and foremost... Man, Jesus came and he died in place of you because you were a mess. He died for Bo because Bo was a screw-up and he didn't have what it took. So he died for me so I could have all of him. Right now, if you're in this house and your heart is not right with Jesus Christ, and you're ready to give your life, submit your life to him wholly. You're ready to give all that you have to him. You're ready to sacrifice all. You're ready to give him your life so that he can give you his. 
And if that's you, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to count to the number four. I don't know why four. I'm going to count to the number four, and I'm going to have you stick your arms up in the air. Here we go. Right now, if you're ready to give your life to him, one, two, three, four. Where are you at? Yeah, praise God. All over the house. Man, praise God. Yes, praise God. Praise God. Yes, Lord. I'm going to wait. Keep them hands up just a second. We're not done yet. Come on. Yes, God. I'm waiting just a second. Is there anyone else? Yes, God. Yes, God. Guys, I'm going to ask you to be brave. I'm going to ask you to get out of that seat and come on down here. I don't do that every week, but I'm going to this week. Come on. Right now. Come on. Right out from where you're at. Need some help. Lord, I'm asking you to lead me. My directions are all gone. I know that your way. Hey, Pastor Bo here. Um, thanks for coming and visiting us here at the Hill. Uh, real briefly, want to talk to you about what it means to serve Jesus Christ. John three sixteen says it all. Uh, for God so loved the world, He so loved you, and He so loved me that He gave His only begotten Son. That's Jesus Christ. That whosoever would believe in Jesus should not perish, but have life, eternity with Him in heaven. Uh, basically, real simple, uh, each and every one of us have sinned. We've all fallen short. Uh, sin just means to miss the mark, to not do what we ought to do. It's something as small as a, a lie or, or taking something that wasn't ours or uh, gossiped about someone and said something that wasn't true. Um, each and every one of us have made mistakes that have separated us from God's heart. God knowing that there was no way we could close that gap. There was no way we could come back into fellowship with him. Sent his only son to die in place of me. He sent his only son to die in place of you. Imagine like a court case. If you're on trial and, and Satan himself was accusing you of every sin and every mistake you've ever made. And the time comes for the verdict. And, and they're about ready to send down your judgment or punishment. Jesus Christ stepped up and he said, I'll go in place of Bo. I'll go in place of each and every one of these. Uh, and he took our punishment. He bore stripes on his back and he died on the cross for stuff that I've done. Not that he did. He was perfect. But for my mistakes, he carried them for me. The Bible says that if I believe in that and if I'll confess with my mouth and I'll believe in my heart that he did that for me, that he'll wipe my slate clean. And it says that we don't have righteousness in and of ourselves, but when I believe that, when I believe that he could do that for me, that I begin to operate on his righteousness, which was perfect. And when I begin to believe that and operate on his righteousness... My slate's clean and I spend eternity with, with him in heaven. Would you pray with me? Father God, I believe Jesus Christ is your son. He came, lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for my sins. Everything I've done wrong. He rose again. He conquered death and he conquered the grave. And he came to bring life, life, life and more life. I thank you right now for, for forgiving every sin I've ever done. Anything I've ever done to separate me from your heart. I thank you that Jesus Christ died to take those sins away. I believe in him right now. I believe he's your son. He died and he rose again. God, today I give you my life. Come into my heart. Make me brand new. Wash me clean. I am yours. Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now say it with me. I am saved. Thanks so much.